Well, hello again, everybody. Well, today on the workbench, we've actually got another radio. Well, I'm sure by now you're all very familiar with my friend Richard at work, who's brought me several radios to repair over the last few years. Now, luckily for me, this radio did actually come with an accompanying note that you can see. Well, Richard, I've got no idea. Let's find out, shall we? OK, so let's start with an initial examination of the set. So it looks like we've actually got a very interesting design of Bakelite case. And I can see that actually just looking at it, would you call it white? I'd probably call this ivory. I don't think, I think they were maybe ivory rather than white. And uh, looking at it, it's, um, it looks as though it's quite heavily contaminated with uh, nicotine. So I would hope that this case would actually clean up quite nicely. Now when it comes to Bakelite radios, if the cases are damaged, you can of course restore them and uh, you know fix cracks in them and stuff like that. But you often then end having to uh, respray them and uh, you know it just an, it becomes an exponential amount of work. So as I said earlier, these radios were actually called toaster radios and uh, I guess that's because they do look a lot like a toaster. But looking at the cabinet on this, it looks in very good condition. So I can see we've got this label that says AC mains only and I've got to admit when I actually first looked at the chassis on this radio I was actually going to say that it was an AC DC set with a live chassis but I actually then spotted there is actually a, a little mains transformer built into this thing but it was it was kind of hidden out of the way and it does look like it uses a, an auto transformer rather than what I would call a traditional step-down transformer. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, but just looking at the underneath of it, again it says here that it, it is a Colster brand. Yeah, Colster Brands Limited, Foots Cray Kent, Foots Cray Kent, made in England. What else can we see? Warning, disconnect, supply before removing base. That's fair enough, isn't it? OK, and it's also got a model number symbol here, but the model number, we, we must have to look through this hole to see what the model number is. So let's, uh, let's just turn this radio over and see... I guess it means that bit there. So the model number is an FB10 and it's got a serial number for all you serial number perverts out there is 89985, 89985 and the model FB10, better known as the toaster radio from the 1950s. So going back to the cabinet, it doesn't actually look as though it's been resprayed or anything. It does look in, well, I've got to admit, absolutely amazing condition. Um, no dent, scratches or dings. Let's try a little bit of our polishing compound on it, just to give us an idea of what it might come up like. So I'm hoping that this Greygate polishing compound number five is done a cut through. I think this is tobacco staining on here, so let's give it a good, good old rub and see if that cleans up. Well, I've got to admit, it has actually put a polish on it, that, but maybe that is its natural colour. It's kind of, rather than being a bright white, it's uh, it's ivory shape. Now, of course, it does come complete, as all old, old radios should do. It's got some, uh, I don't know, some brown emulsion paint splashed on it, but of course we wouldn't have it anyway, because, uh, yes, all valve radios need to be liberally splashed in uh, emulsion paint, so yes, it's got that on it. But, yeah, that didn't polish up. I thought that was going to come out white it certainly took a polish but no it must be it must be an ivory color now Richard brings me all types of antique radios and record players and things like that to repair and uh, I've got to admit I quite enjoy doing it I think one of the best things about it is when I actually get to repair one of these things you know it's like other people's children they're nice to play with but it's good to give them back at the end of the day isn't it you know it's very nice to give the opportunity to work on them and fix them because that's where the enjoyment is but I, I don't often want to keep them at the end of it, so I think I might have trouble giving this one back to Richard, but we will do. So taking a look at the radio chassis for the first time, I can see there's some lovely filth and crud down here. I'm sure that will respond well to my wife's toothbrush. So we'll go ahead and give that a clean shortly. Now when I first saw this radio, I looked at this thing on top. And uh, I thought at first glance that this was a mains dropper resistor because a little tiny set like this, I was expecting it to be, as I say, an AC-DC set, probably with a live chassis, something like that. Um, but I was but I was mistaken on that. This isn't actually uh, a mains dropper because it is, you know, it's obviously waxy to the touch. This is some kind of, I think it's a frame antenna. I think that's what that does. I'm kind of hoping that there's no tuning components or capacitors uh, embedded inside this because it could be a difficult thing to repair. 
not looked at the circuit diagrams yet so I'm not sure so here's the actual main step down transformer that I was mentioning before and uh, it's not a conventional primary and secondary transformer it uses an auto transformer so I guess much like a live chassis radio we probably need to make sure that the uh, the neutral conductor here and again black wires now we've left the EU so now we've got the black wires on here we need to make sure that the black wire is actually connected to the chassis of the radio so we can see that the mains flex here actually comes into the radio and it terminates directly onto the actual on and off switch come volume control so I'm guessing that again the black wire here which would be neutral if we look at the switch here we can see that the neutral wire that obviously jumps via the switch to the uh, chassis of the radio this wire is soldered onto the tag on the chassis whereas the positive wire here switches through to the input of our well I was going to say it switches directly to the input of the transformer but oh yeah it does so much dirt and dust in there I thought the wire went somewhere else but oh it does go somewhere else where does that wire go to it actually looks as though it goes to these large resistors so could it employ some form of dropper resistor you know I'm not exactly sure we'll have to take a close look at that with the aid of the circuit diagram won't we so I'm guessing that the transformer down here, that's going to be our audio output transformer. Looks like at this corner of the radio we've got a rectifier valve, can we get that out? So taking a look at the valve envelope, it actually looks in good condition. I can't really see any burning at all. Maybe this radio hasn't had a lot of use. Now interestingly enough the actual trader's sheet for this radio that contains the circuit diagrams and other information it actually describes this radio as being an occasional type of receiver. So yeah, designed for occasional use. I would have thought maybe they mean something like a, a bedside radio, something like that. Maybe a set that wouldn't be in the main living room or something like that. I guess if you were fairly well to do and you could afford to have more than one radio in your household then this was maybe, yeah, just a, another receiver you had in the bedroom or some other room, but not, not the main family listening receiver, if you like. Oops, got distracted for a moment then by the uh, tuning control. You see that? Look, as we turn the tuning control, the actual dial lamp moves up and down with it. <laughs> it must provide some illumination under the scale pointer there. I've never seen that before. Have you ever seen a, a radio that has a moving dial lamp on it? And uh, that's one of the interesting things about this radio. It's just full of interesting and quirky little design features. Oh, so we've got another valve here. I think this is probably, I don't know, mixer stroke frequency changer. It appears to be very close to the tuning section, so I'm going to guess that's what it is, although I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, 6BE6. So taking a look at the manufacturer's data sheet, it does describe it as being a Brimar 6BE6, which it certainly is, and that's a heptode frequency changer valve. So again, taking a close look at the valve now, we've given it a wipe, it looks in, well, great condition. I see, I see nothing wrong with that, and again, no signs of burning. The reason I'm pulling these valves out is because this radio is just so thick with crud and dirt, I actually want to give it a clean. Okay, I'm guessing we've got an audio output valve here, which is a 6BW6 another Brimar valve. So looking at this set it does in fact look like uh, this radio's probably had pretty much um, no use because it's still got its original set of valves in it. So taking a look inside the radio I can see another couple of valves which are fairly deep down. These are quite well hidden within the set itself so I don't think I can just get these out very easily for now so we'll have to come back and we'll have a closer look at them later when we've given it a clean. Oh, also just spotted and you probably won't be able to see it right deep down again buried behind the loudspeaker that looks like um, our main smoothing capacitors tucked down there. Again quite a sizeable can and uh, yeah, almost completely inaccessible. So this is almost like the Sony Walkman of its day, isn't it? It really is quite a compact set. They've really packed everything in here. Okay, so we've got a two band, we've got a long wave and a medium wave. And again, unusual, a slider switch. Just full of interesting design features, isn't it? Ooh, what's that I've just spotted? Well, I don't know what's happened to our volume and main switch, but uh, yeah, got some serious, serious shenanigans that have gone on there, haven't we? So we're going to have to do our best to repair this because uh, 
well it doesn't even turn it looks as though at some point in the past somebody's maybe used a soldering iron trying to uh, melt the plastic together and make this function maybe we'll put this on the lathe and machine it out and make a new insert to recenter it gonna have to do some fairly radical repair work like that i think Hmm, yeah, that's in a bit of a mess. So of course we can see our normal complement of uh, waxy capacitors, so we know they're going to be bad, so we'll go ahead and we'll change them out, and as we usually do, we'll just test a few for a laugh, because it's always nice to see exactly how awful these things are. Can you spot any other work? I'm not sure I can see any other work done to this. It doesn't look as though it's been hacked or budged or messed with, and of course that's another important thing when you're actually working on a on a valve receiver in fact any type of equipment for that matter we don't like to be repairing other people's fixes do we because it can be quite hard work again there's our switch here our band select switch but so far i'm not really spotting any serious issues i can see some of these uh treacherous hunts capacitors down here one up there one down there so we'll probably have to take a look at that Got some square mica capacitors, they'll probably be okay. So let's start by checking the mains transformer. I would expect to see a reasonably low reading. Okay, well, 3 mega ohms isn't the reasonably low reading I was expecting to see. So first thing is, is it actually switched on? And I think it might be hard to tell given the state of this terrible switch. Oh, it wasn't switched on, so that explains that. So we've switched it on now, and we've turned it up to full volume. Now hopefully we should get a more sensible reading now. Yep, yeah, 175 ohms, probably in the ballpark. So the transformer on this radio is quite interesting. Uh, hopefully you can see that it is just tucked down here somewhere and that it is an auto transformer. And I think this is the first time I've actually worked on a radio that, that uses an auto transformer. So yeah, they're not terribly common, I wouldn't say. Now, I think in the past you've probably seen me using this audio impedance meter. Now, I'm not particularly interested in measuring the audio impedance of this uh, this circuit or anything like that but it's quite good because it's a good source of having a, a simple kind of audio generator so what we'll do is I'm just going to see if I can inject a little bit of audio into our output transformer and usually I think you can hear it So we have audio, so we've got a working audio transformer, so that's a good sign as well. Now you can also see that the speaker cone on this radio is in absolutely beautiful condition. Now of course the problem with that is that it becomes very very magnetic to anything which may be sharp or pointy and it will just get magically attracted to the cone of the speaker and end up penetrating it and generally buggering it. So we need to put a cover on that to stop damage before it occurs. Well, I don't know what you guys think about the bodge to this volume control knob here, but me, I cannot up put with. So it hasn't even been glued. Somebody's actually just got something like a hot soldering iron and they've just tried to pull the plastic and press it against the... Uh, the nylon of this, uh, I say nylon, it's probably Delrin or something, it could be nylon, but somebody's, uh, somebody's just tried to melt it against the, uh, the shaft of the uh, volume control pot here, and uh, well, what a mess, what an absolute bodge, how could somebody do such a job like that? Well, I've just been trying to decide the best way to repair this, and I think probably what we need to do is we need to machine out the centre of this, and then actually manufacture a new boss which can slip inside this old plastic knob and pick up on the uh, potentiometer control shaft here. Now, that is something that I could do, but my friend Richard, whose radio this belongs to, he actually has recently bought a 3D printer, 
and I think he would probably quite like to do that as a little task. He could draw it up in Fusion 360. And uh, if I machine a hole out here for him, he could actually make a new piece of plastic about the same diameter as this radius, this inside radius here. Um, and he could use that to actually centre the knob then and uh, make a new boss for it, which would just push onto this shaft. So I think that's what we'll do, or rather that's what Richard will probably do. So if he does that, we'll have to get Richard to uh, to give us some pictures of the final thing, won't we? Well, I was pretty much just going to power it up there, but then I spotted the terrible state of this uh, C18 capacitor. I always I can never remember how to pronounce this, but I think this is a Zobel capacitor. Basically, it goes across the primary of the audio output transformer, and just looking at the state of it, it just caught my eye. Now, I've said in the past, these are quite a highly stressed component because you get a flyback effect from the, uh, the audio output transformer. It would almost certainly help if I bothered to switch this soldering iron on, wouldn't it? So we'll do that now. Um, so this capacitor is connected across the the primary of the audio output transformer and uh, these capacitors although you may not think it obviously see the anode voltage of the output valve which is potentially quite high but they can also see uh, you know approximately like several times the uh, the HT voltage of the radio because from that audio output transformer you get a flyback effect because it is just a big coil of wire so you need to rate these capacitors maybe a lot higher than you would think that they should be rated. So just looking at the end of this capacitor, I don't know if it's already blown out because uh, they can't do have a habit of doing that it, or it's maybe just a, a bodge wire that's been soldered on but it, it certainly doesn't look original that something, some shenanigans has gone on there. Well it's actually measuring 80 nanofarads so basically that isn't right. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I think it's about time that Mr. Volt took a short trip to Capacitor Town. So we're going to go ahead and uh, have a go at doing some reformulating business. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can do this, of course. This way is no better than the others, but because I happen to have a high voltage power supply here, which I can actually uh, wind up and down, and it's also got a current meter on it, we can actually wind up the uh, voltage slowly to this main smoothing capacitor here, and uh, hopefully it shouldn't have such a rude awakening then. So this lead here, it's just got a 30k resistor in it, which is just acting to limit the current. You can also just wind the voltage up very slowly, as well. Well I can't see that we're drawing any current so uh, I think we're going to probably start off by putting about 100 volts on this and just see how we go. And uh, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave this to uh, to reform for I don't know half an hour or so and then when we get close to uh, 100 volts on here we'll maybe up the voltage again. Now it may actually take a little bit of time for the actual voltage on the capacitor to rise close to my 100 volt setting here but of course that means that this current limiting resistor is actually doing its job. It's actually limiting the current to a very low level to actually give our main smoothing capacitor time to actually reform its insulating layer. OK, well I've brought you back in, it's literally only about 10 minutes later and uh, our B plus voltage is up to 97 volts now so I'm going to push that up a little bit more I'm going to push that towards 200 and then uh, this actual voltage is really rising quite quickly so it looks as though this uh, main smoothing capacitor is probably going to be okay. Okay so we've had our capacitors reforming for the last few hours and uh, kind of the main thing we're looking for is the fact that we aren't drawing any current and actually the uh, the voltage from the power supply here effectively pretty much uh, matches the voltage across the meter here so we're not pulling any current so I'm going to take that as a good sign so what we can do is let's just disconnect this lead and uh, let's short this out on something and uh, just pull the voltage off that capacitor before I put my finger on something and we've done with my Heath kit power supply now so we'll turn that back to zero volts it really is a useful power supply this I wish I'd got one of these Heath kits years ago now normally I think I'd probably wake this up with a variac but I'm actually having a change of plan today. I think I'll actually just go ahead and uh, run it up on the lamp limiter because as I say the capacitors have been reformed now so I would have thought it should come up. Now I think I will just indulge myself with a small safety feature and uh, just put a little bit of uh, tape over this uh, the terminals on this 
main switch because they are very exposed at the edge here and uh, quite easy for me to put my hand on there which uh, wouldn't be very pleasant. Now the nominal draw for this radio should be around um, 40 watts I believe so I think we'll go ahead with 100 watt bulbs in the lamp limiter here. We can actually keep an eye on the power draw using this wall wart that I've got plugged in over here. Okay I'm going to set that to just above half volume and I think we're ready to give that a go aren't we? Do you want to place your bets before we switch on? Are we going to get any noise? Are we going to get a crackle? Is it just going to go bang? Um, make your bets. Well, I'm going to switch on now. Well, we've got a dial light, so that's a good sign. And my lamp limiter isn't glowing even slightly, so the radio's not drawing a lot. This might start glowing when the heaters warm up, assuming they do warm up. Well, we're getting some hum from the radio, and I can see, unfortunately you guys can't see it, can you, because all the valves are at the back. The, um, the HD rectifier is lit. I think the frequency change is lit. I can certainly see a pale glow coming from the output valve, and I can hear some very low level hum from the radio, but it's, it is very low level. I was thinking we should get something louder than that. Okay, the radio's drawing 32 watts. Frequency change switch seems... Well, I thought we had a bit of life then. I don't know. Oh, we've got a bulb starting to glow a bit brighter there. <laughs> okay, there's the culprit. So we've got a waxy capacitor here which is boiling away. So that wax capacitor uh, is going short circuit. So yeah, you end up changing these things. So of course C9 is the across the mains capacitor, so <laughs> yes, that's the one that should always be changed. I forgot about it, didn't I? Oh well. So we're just going to do a very quick fix on there. There we go, fixed. <laughs> gathering words so they'll have poems in the winter. He's gathering light so that they'll have light in the dark. I'm going to read you, actually it's, it's probably the best part of half the book. <laughs> Okay, so we've got some uh, we've got some long wave action, but we've got very little on medium wave. Quite surprised at that. In my experience, it's usually the other way around that um, medium wave seems to come in quite loudly, but um, long wave is usually pretty poor. Well, as you may have seen earlier, the actual medium wave reception was really quite poor. In fact, it was non-existent. So what I've done is, while I went to find my uh, my thinking head. I decided to go ahead and replace the rest of these capacitors in here. Not that I thought they would affect it, it's just that I knew that all those waxy capacitors would need to come out at some point. So while I thought about the low medium wave signal, I, uh, I went ahead and did that. So the other thing that I've just done is I've gone away and I've cleaned the, uh, the wave changer switch. So we've certainly got one medium wave station. Now although I do work on valve radios, I've not exactly done hundreds of them, so for me it's always a little bit of a dilemma when you're faced with a situation like this. And I always wonder, is the set, is there something wrong with this set, or is that how they were back in the day? And I've got to admit, my medium wave reception here tends to be quite poor at the best of the time, so it's a bit of a dilemma. Is this set working properly or not? Well, one thing that does seem to improve it, of course, is if I just plug in an external aerial. So let me do that. Thank you. 
mindent kobott. Ofta be Krisztiánzen, majd az Eminkó egyre többször megtalálta a falban a brácetet, és a két célen fodor So with an external aerial plugged in, this little set really comes alive. So it does leave me wondering, I mean looking at actually the, um, I don't know if this is, this is a frame antenna that they've got in the back here. I'm not sure if it's a ferrite rod based antenna or not actually, or if it's just a tube with some windings on it. Um, certainly it's an awful lot smaller than, for example, the antenna in the Bush DAC-10 we looked at last week. And uh, the reception on the Bush DAC-10 wasn't exactly stunning in here. So I'm kind of thinking that maybe this uh, set just isn't a particularly good performer and it really does benefit from having an external antenna. But the fact that it's an occasional use radio, well who'd want to rig up an antenna for an occasional use radio? So it's a little bit of a puzzler, I'm sure you'll agree. But I think one thing that we probably can do is we can probably go ahead and... Uh, have a go at trying to do some alignment on this radio because I'm sure that could only improve things. Away from my, just chops it back onto his right foot. Thought it went through the uh, the legs of Miley there, but it's a lovely little back heel. He just chops it onto his right foot. He's got a couple of markers around him. It just sneaks in at that near post for Pazant. He tries to get down low, but it's got that much pace on it. It beats the goalkeeper before he can get down to that post. But super finish from Divine to make it 5-0 to Spurs. Well, I suppose, bearing in mind he's the youngest player, he's the youngest goal scorer now as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that record was uh, once held in the Premier League, Sam, by James Milner. OK, that bit of twiddling there, that wasn't an alignment. I was just giving the IF cores some adjustment just to see if they would peak. So I actually think that we might gain a little bit by doing an alignment on this radio. So I think that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Now, of course, by now you know that I like to ignore the, um, the alignment instructions where it tells you to start connecting things to grids of various using capacitors and stuff like that. I much prefer to use uh, an external loop antenna and I especially like to do it that way when I'm working on sets that potentially have a live chassis because any way you want to avoid connecting a ground connection to here the better even though it is actually running from an isolation transformer. So I think what I will do is I'm not going to follow the actual alignment instructions. I think I'm going to try and align it using my loop antenna. So it actually gives the intermediate frequency as being 422 kilohertz, and I've gone ahead and I've set the signal generator to to do that. And uh, you may be able to hear we're injecting a very low level signal at the moment. You can maybe hear it there. It's certainly not very loud. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, pop twiggling and just see if we can actually peak up. The alignment. I think it probably is on 422 because I could hear a tone right away with this loop antenna and I am actually injecting quite a low level signal via my loop. It's much lower than I was using for that DAC-10 for example. So I am fairly sure that we probably have got the intermediate frequency correct. Now of course you can use a voltmeter to actually measure the output volume from the speaker to peak these. To be quite honest I find it just as easy to listen. Okay, so I think that's peaked. That really hasn't come up very much. That maybe came up a little bit. Well, I seem to do best on this one when I screw this core fully in. OK, well, I've done something there. I've got to admit, it's got that kind of wobbling noise where the IF becomes a little bit unstable when you kind of overpeak it. Um, so I'm not sure on that. I wonder if we've actually improved the, uh, the medium wave reception. We've probably made it worse. Let's, uh, let's find out. Ah, right, OK, we have improved it because we haven't got an aerial plugged in and... Ah, oh, right, OK. So that, that has actually responded quite well, hasn't it? In the FA Cup as well, John. Yep, you can't take that away. So while, you know, it brings me joy to see him in his new phase, 
it has presented challenges that I think weren't expected. Well, long wave seemed a little bit better, maybe a bit louder, but certainly medium wave seems to be a quite a good improvement. I think I may just go through those again because they can be a little bit interactive, can't they? OK, well that completes the IF alignment for this receiver and I think we have made a worthwhile improvement. Certainly it's working a lot better and it's more sensitive than it was. So the next thing we have to do is fully mesh our tuning capacitor here, so fully engage the veins on it for maximum capacitance. So you can see that now we've fully meshed the tuning capacitor, the uh, pointer here does line up here with this little uh, alignment mark, the datum they call it on the data sheet. The pointer does line up with the datum. Now what you could do is, if it wasn't quite lined up, what you would do at this point is you would actually just get the pointer and uh, it's being pushed up and down here by the dial cord. You would actually just slide the pointer slightly up and down the dial cord until this was zeroed here on the datum point. But this is pretty close so we're going to leave it at that. So the next part of the adjustment is we're going to actually adjust the local oscillator to actually align the pointer here with the bottom end, the lower frequency part of the tuning scale. And they've actually given us an alignment mark here. So what I'm going to do is I've set my signal generator to 600 kilohertz, which is 500 meters. And if I tune the radio in, we should actually, if the radio's perfectly aligned, we should actually get peak output here. So let me just go and tune that in. So you can see that our dial point is slightly off, it's actually closer to this upper mark rather than the lower mark which should be 600 kilohertz. So we're going to have to do some alignment here. So what we're going to do is, we're going to set the, uh, the pointer here so it's on the 500 meters stroke 600 kilohertz mark because 500 meters and 600 kilohertz are the same thing. And uh, now I've got to carefully turn the radio over without electrocuting myself. I've got my loop antenna here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to adjust this inductor down here. Hopefully you can see it. I'm going to adjust inductor L4 to get peak output from the radio. Getting quieter, so I'm going the wrong way. Getting louder. Getting much louder. Right, it gets to a point where the signal gets so loud I actually want to... Uh, I want to move my loop antenna, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn it round because that couples in much less signal there. So you see it's reduced in volume, so I'm going to peak that again. Still getting a bit loud, so I'm going to turn my loop aerial, reduce the signal coming in again. Okay, I'm going to call that done. So now our pointer, when we tune it into 600 kilohertz, that coincides with the scale on the radio here to 500 meters, which is what we want. So I've just reset the signal generator to 1400 kilohertz. That should line up with a mark here on the uh, on this calibration scale. Oh, and actually, it does. That lines up bang on. Now I'm quite glad about that because what I was going to go on to explain is I don't really fancy making this adjust adjustment. We've actually got to uh, adjust some what I would call, probably call them gimmick capacitors to make this adjustment. Let me show you. Hopefully I can get the camera in. So I'm hoping you can see here we've got these almost look like matchsticks sticking up. We've got one here and we've got one further along the tuning gang. So on each of the tuning gangs we've got one of these stuck up matchsticks. Now one of those matchsticks is uh, adjusting the local oscillator and the other matchstick is actually adjusting the actual um, front end tuning of the radio. I'm not sure which one is which actually. Uh, now these actually may look like inductors because looking at it it's a piece of wire and it's actually got another piece of lint wire which has been wrapped around it. Um, but it isn't actually an inductor, it's actually a capacitor. And what they tell us to do is, I think you're meant to actually 
slide this uh, lintz wire up and down this central conductor that's how they tell you to make the adjustment well to be quite honest I'm going to chicken out I'm not going to do that I did try to move one earlier and uh, yeah it didn't want to budge those are the sort of things that if you mess with them these dingleberries are going to break off in my hands aren't they and then we'll be in a world of pain so I'm going to choose the discretion is the better part of valour and I'm going to leave these buggers alone now as it happens luckily the HF end of the band here does line up precisely with the actual uh, calibration mark here. So I'm glad to say we haven't got any need to adjust that local oscillator because it's spot on. So that concludes the alignment of firstly the IF section and then we went ahead and we've aligned the medium wave section. Now that only leaves us the long wave section to do and that's relatively simple, just one adjustment. So what the alignment instructions tell us to do, we actually need to tune the radio. Well we, first of all we've got to actually put it into long wave so let me do that. Let's put the radio into long wave and now we've actually got to tune the radio into uh, 175 kilohertz and again they've given us an alignment mark here which is 175 kilohertz so let me go ahead and do that. So for me, unfortunately, that does seem to bring in some noise. Long wave is a fairly noisy band for me here. And we've got to reset the signal generator. And amazingly enough, we've got to reset that to 175 kilohertz. So let me do that. Now for this particular radio, we've now got to go ahead and we've got to adjust this trimmer here, which in the service instructions is trimmer T1. And again, we're just going to adjust that to get a peak. which for me it only took a little bit of adjustment is about there okay so that completes the alignment of our long wave section so we'll just tune in the uh, I think about the only station I can pick up on this radio is actually uh, I think it's 198 it's actually radio 4 from Droitwich so let's see if we can tune that in but as our travel correspondent Caroline Davis explains there are other restrictions that these groups of people will have to take into account what might be difficult is trying to find a flight to get back, um, particularly from someone who might have been in Portugal. A lot of the South American direct flights. So, as you can probably hear, my long wave reception is generally pretty bad here anyway. But one thing I have noticed can you hear a little bit of a, a warble on the signal? Let me just tune it back in. The number of people waiting for a routine hospital appointment was almost four and a half million at the end of November, a new record high. Health officials say it shows how much... you can hear there's like a high-pitched whine in the background. Now, I'm not sure what that is. I was wondering, if it, is it some form of IF instability? So I'm not sure what's causing that. I've had this on a few radios in the past, so I'm not, I'm not dead sure if it's a problem just with my local listening conditions here, if it's interference or it's some form of instability. It could be that I haven't done such a great job of aligning this radio, so I'll be quite happy to hear it in your comments if you, if you can just tell me what's so causing this. Relative of a teenage motorcyclist you hear that? in a road accident outside a US airbase in Northamptonshire. One of the internal emails had criticised the family. Anyway, I'd be interested to see what you guys think. I think I'm going to end it there. This doesn't have a completely happy ending, but such is life, eh? So until next time, as always, thanks very much for watching. I hope to see you again very soon, and then we'll be powering up the television. So I'll see you then. Bye-bye for now. Yeah.